Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming and attending. And I know end of, end of the getting toward the end of the conference, end of the day, so I appreciate it. I'll try to make it a little bit fun and entertaining for you so that uh, it's worth your time. By way of background and introduction, uh, I actually cut my teeth on this chaos engineering failure testing back at Amazon.com about 10 years ago. I was part of the retail website team. And when Amazon.com goes down, they don't make money. They can't collect money. It's very expensive. And we did a lot of reactive things, kind of your traditional ops approaches. You know, incident reviews. We did good incident management. You know, we tried to fix things as fast as possible. But for the aggressive availability goals we had, we needed to do something better. We needed to be proactive and prevent whole classes of outages from occurring. And so I had the opportunity to build a platform for creating this failure in a safe and a secure way, and then go about and help the teams within Amazon use it. And part of what I'll talk about today is this idea of a game day, where uh, really the, the root of that comes from Jesse Robbins doing this by hand at Amazon in the early 2000s. After my time at Amazon, I wanted to go deeper into this space, and so I went and joined Netflix. So while I was at Amazon, they had come up with this idea of Chaos Monkey. So I'm not, I didn't write Chaos Monkey. It was there before I showed up. But when I arrived, there was actually an opportunity to improve. The monkeys were a good first pass, but they weren't good enough for the kind of in-depth production testing that we needed to do. So I had the opportunity to build the next generation fault injection platform. It was codenamed FIT, F-I-T, for surprisingly failure injection testing. And the, that allowed us to do much more precise, fine-grained fault injection. And we used that to test from dev and staging through 100% and prod. And we had good results from both, both companies. And so having seen that be successful, I founded Gremlin to take the, the tooling and the culture and the approach and bring it to the rest of the world. So with that, let me start by a little bit of a definition. What is chaos engineering? And here's where I'm going to pick on Chaos Monkey a little bit. Um, a lot of people have heard of Chaos Monkey. By, by show of hands, pretty much everybody. It's, it's become pretty well known. But one thing I disagree with on Chaos Monkey is the idea that this kind of testing has to be done randomly. There's a time and a place for random fault injection. But the way that we think about it is, is a little different. So one of the analogies that I love to draw when I'm home for the holidays or I'm talking to my family and they ask, what is it you do, is that of the vaccine or the flu shot. You know, if we went back 200 years and we said, hey, I'm going to inject you with this disease, is that cool? You might have got a mixed result. But we know that there's some benefits to this. This process is called hormesis, by which a system or uh, an organism adapts to harm in order to become stronger. And so the same technique applies in our software systems. By injecting something harmful, we're able to understand how the system behaves. We're able to find opportunities for improving both our software and ourselves as, as an organization and as people. And we're able to harden our responses to become immune to classes of failure. So my definition for chaos engineering is thoughtful, planned experiments designed to reveal the weakness in our system. And it's important to do, in my opinion, thoughtful planned experiments because we want to measure them. We want to understand the impact. We want to treat it like the scientific method, where we have some hypotheses about our system, and we want to validate whether or not those are true. And in that process, we may uncover new information. Our systems are, are complex, and there's a lot of depth to them. And often, we don't write all of the code that runs. There are libraries. There are dependent services. And so it's hard for any of us to really know in depth how the system behaves without some experimentation. And the key here, and I, I mentioned this as I introduced uh, in my introduction, is that this allows us to be proactive. There's a fundamental reactive approach to operations, but that will never get us to a certain degree of reliability. If we're always waiting for things to fail and then quickly fixing them and trying to prevent them from occurring again, we're never going to be ahead of the curve. And so we need to be able to go out. We need to do this proactively. We need to do it during the day. We need to be able to plan for these kind of failures and prepare for them. 
one of, the, one of the things I always get some pushback on with chaos engineering is, well, that's not feature work. And feature work is what makes us money. So I don't know if we can go spend time on this. And really, operations is a, is a cost that we pay. When things break, you, that takes time away from feature development. It takes time away from other aspects of the company. And so by being thoughtful about it, by planning time to spend on this, we can actually save ourselves time and we can better budget and prepare for the types of things that occur. So what's a good definition without an anti-definition? What is not chaos engineering? Well, to me, it's not about being a cowboy or a cowgirl, just running into production, guns blazing, shooting servers, breaking stuff without telling anyone. Uh, it's, not, it's not a lone wolf game. This is a place where we want to collaborate. We want to communicate. We want to make our whole company better. We want to test the communication boundaries of our services and our teams. And so it's not something to be hidden. It's not something to be done in the background. It's something to be done you know, in the daylight, to be embraced, and to be able to go out and, and spread the good word in some ways, to help our teams and our companies understand that failure occurs often at scale. And it's prudent and wise to be thinking about it in advance and preparing for it. It's, it's funny to me the, the way in which the name chaos engineering has taken off. And I've thought a bit about why that is. You know, the, the chaos name, this is where things are exciting. It's mischievous. You know, this gives it that kind of a fun, playful attitude. But the engineering side, you know, we're still getting that disciplined, respectable approach of applying good engineering discipline to our systems. I actually think because of Chaos Monkey and because of the implied randomness that it brought, that this name is a bit of a misnomer. It's not about wielding chaos to better engineer our systems. In fact, I think we'd be better served by flipping it around. What we want to do is we want to take the disciplined, respected engineering practices that we have and apply them to the chaos that is already inherent in our environments. We have enough chaos, there's enough things that break and go wrong that we don't necessarily, we can use that as a tool, but we don't need to. So another question that I've, I've thought a bit about is, you know, why has this become a topic of interest of late? You know, I've done research in this space and there are uh, talks and papers on this, on failure testing that go back in the 70s and the 80s. There's a lot of good blog posts from the 90s and the early 2000s that describe this same process and this same methodology. So what's changed in the last five or 10 years that has really brought about the need for this approach? Well, one, our systems used to look a little bit different. Uh, this is a bit of an oversimplification, but you know, kind of the old school approach is we had some data centers and we could redirect traffic between them. Within our data centers, our applications were a little bit more straightforward. You know, they tended to be three tier. We had some front end, we had some business logic. We let the database handle a lot of the consistency issues and a lot of the sticky bits. Obviously, our systems today look a little bit different. Uh, this is a picture of Amazon.com. This is actually circa 2008. Uh, I was on the team that generated this graph. This is just Amazon.com. There's nothing from Kindle or digital. There's nothing from AWS there. The graph on the other side is Netflix. This is actually also predates me. This is like 2010, 2012. And you know what we have, I call these the microservice death balls. You know, it's almost like the Death Star. This, the degree of complexity within our systems now is too much for any one engineer or any one team to keep entirely in their head. You know, we can no longer rely on an architect to understand all of the failure modes and protect us from it. There's just too many things going on. It also makes it more difficult for us to go about and test these things. One question I get is, you know, well, I can just do a bunch of unit testing and cover a lot of these cases. But really, we're testing these boundaries between microservices. And so, you know, if we look at something that has even 100 microservices, just testing all combinations of failure there, that's two to the 100 possibilities. If we just go through that in a brute force method, the sun will burn out before we finish that test path. And so we need something that's more effective and more efficient to be able to understand this type of complexity. 
And I would posit that chaos engineering, to me, has been proven to be a valuable tool to accomplish that. In the end, predicting failure is a little bit like predicting the weather. You know, chaos theory tells us if we, had all, if we knew all of the input variables, if we knew all of the ways in which those variables interacted, we could model correctly how the system would behave and what would occur. But just as when, but, but we don't. We don't know all the variables. We can't calculate all of the possible combinations of things that can occur. There's human factors. There's technical factors. There's things out of our control, you know? Most of us don't own our own hardware anymore. There's so many moving pieces that it becomes very difficult to predict. And so in a way, we're modeling. And as we get more information, we're adjusting that model. One of the differences between you know, predicting hurricanes and predicting outages in software is we can go and simulate these types of events. We can do it in a safe way, in a thoughtful way, but we can actually cause these failures. You know, if we could spawn a hurricane in the Atlantic of a small size and then despawn it when we were done with it, if we had that halt button in case things went wrong, maybe we could better model those. And so I think we're at a little bit of an advantage compared to predicting and modeling in other complex systems. So I want to talk a little bit about what goes into planning a game day and how to think about what can go wrong and how to think about how to go out and effectively do this testing. And the first question is just that, what could go wrong? One of the things I love to do when I'm working with a new team or a new customer is to get a bunch of engineers in the room and whiteboard out their service. Just, just draw me an example of what it looks like. Show me some of the interactions. This is a simplified version of the Netflix API. And within it, we have some caching. We have some dependent services that we cross network bounds. Netflix uses the circuit breaker pattern in Hystrix as a way to add some extra protection around faults that could occur. So right here, if we say what could go wrong, there's a bunch of things that spring out to me. First of all, anytime I see a network connection, I'm dubious. Uh, the network is not reliable, and it is not our friend. Uh, it's often the cause of our pain and headache. And so we're going to want to test what happens if we can't talk to the playlist service. We're going to want to see what happens if the rating service all of a sudden gets much slower or the response times double. What happens if we rely heavily on our caches to be able to handle the throughput of our system and that cache goes away? I've lived through this outage a few times. Uh, you scale up the dependent service real quick and, and hope to get or hope to fix the cache. And so there's a lot of these potential points that could fail or that may not behave correctly. So from this, we're enumerating out a set of things that may be interesting for us to explore or to better understand. The second question I like to ask is one to help with the prioritization. How likely is this to occur? And this is, a, this is a double edged sword in the way that we ask this question. On one hand, if we've had three outages this year and they all feel very similar, they were all related to an availability zone failing, or they were all related to one service going down, then we know there's some low hanging fruit there. We can go and we can spend some time testing those failures and ensuring that we're resilient to them or we handle them better. The flip side is there is the idea of the black swan event the event that may be extremely rare, but may have a catastrophic impact to your business when it occurs. And that may not be something that happens often, but you want to prepare for it because we like having our jobs and our companies. We don't want them to necessarily go away. There's a great example in the high frequency trading world of a bug that made it into production that lost $300 million in a minute or two. Uh, that was the end of that company. Like, it's worth spending some extra time and effort to prevent those rare cases, even though they're infrequent. So from this, we think through what could go wrong. We think through how likely it is to occur. We prioritize it. And from that, we're going to come up with a set of experiments, a set of hypotheses about how our system behaves and how we think the outcome will happen. The last question I like to ask, and I think this is a valuable one, especially as we're talking to our leadership or our management, about the cost. What is the cost of being wrong? Software is expensive to write. It's expensive to maintain. And so we need to be able to, we need to, be able to justify the time and effort we spend on these types of approaches. Outages are expensive. 
Uh, when S3 failed two years ago, it was estimated to cost everyone that wasn't Amazon $150 million. We've had two major airline outages in the past year, British Airways and Delta. Both were $100 million plus in lost revenue and in impact. In the US, it's estimated to be $700 billion lost due to outages and downtime. There's a good metric, but I think a little dated metric, that estimates that in the data center world, the cost of downtime is $5,000 a minute or $300,000 an hour. As we think about it, you know, coming from the Amazon e-commerce world, when you're down, you're losing revenue. That, there's a direct line of sight to that money being lost. And Netflix, it's a subscription-based system. And so while downtime doesn't directly impact revenue, it impacts the brand and customer trust. And if your customers stop trusting you, they may decide to go to a competing service. They may decide it's not worth paying you or continuing on. And all of these metrics kind of ignore what to me is the iceberg that sits beneath the water, which is the engineering cost associated with outages and downtime. We often think of an outage as being, you know, hopefully a 15 to 20, 30 minute time period where all hands are on deck to go fix whatever's wrong. But that's not the entirety of the cost of an outage. Having lived through years of them, you know, then there's the day or two of going and diving into all of the data and the metrics, doing the analysis to understand the contributing factors and the aspects that led to that outage. There's typically a meeting, a correction of error or a post-mortem where a big part of the company is in the room to talk about that failure, the customer impact, and what happens. From that, there's usually a whole set of action items that need to go out and be fixed to prevent this outage from ever reoccurring again. And then someone has to go out and implement those and ideally actually test that they protect you. I actually think that's a part of the loop that tends to be missing in our systems. We tend to fix the action items and cross our fingers and just, well, if it occurs again, we'll know whether it fixed it. And right there, that's where chaos engineering, we're actually going out and recreating that failure to see if you've fixed the system and you've made it more resilient is key. But the engineering time and effort that goes into that entire process is alone very expensive. And so these three factors really help us understand why the business should be interested in investing the time and the effort into this type of approach. So now I want to tell you a little bit about how I see running game days and what I think is an effective way to approach this. The first step is that we need to communicate. As I mentioned, this isn't you know, a, solo, a lone wolf activity. We want to be able to have the company aware that we're doing these kinds of activities. We typically want to have some command center where people can check in. Maybe we're going to do it at an, in a Slack room. Maybe we're going to have a conference bridge. Maybe it's going to be at someone's desk. But one place that people that are interested can come and understand what's occurring and how it's behaving. This gives us a place to share metrics, to share alerts. We want to we over-communicate that we're running these experiments. We may want to have customer success present or aware. They may be able to feel customer pain and see issues before we're able to detect them. And that's cr critical. We want to ensure that we have our upstream and our downstream systems present. You know, if we could potentially be impacting them or they could be impacting us, then they should be aware that this kind of exercise is occurring. And one thing that's critical for running these game days is that we want to prevent customer pain. The goal of these experiments, the goal of this game day is to prevent outages. It's to prevent downtime. And so we don't want to accidentally cause downtime as part of running these experiments. And so with that, I want to explain this concept of the blast radius. Whenever we're running an experiment, there's a risk, whether it's in dev or staging or in production, that we could break fellow engineers, that we could break customers, that we could cause pain and a loss of effectiveness. And so what we want to do is when we run an experiment, we want to run the smallest experiment that will teach us something. If we can run it on a single user, a single set of requests, a single device, Maybe it's a single container or a single host, but we want to run the smallest experiment that will work. And then at each step, we're either going to grow that blast radius, we're going to move to running a larger experiment because we've built some trust and confidence in the system, or 
we're going to have found a bug, and we're going to be able to go fix that bug, and we've won. Because the goal is to find bugs before, before they cause us pain. And so here, we have a hypothesis. So we've enumerated the things that could go wrong. We're going to run this experiment. We're going to measure the outcome of that experiment. Oftentimes, we want to know, does our engagement work correctly? Do we get paged when things break? Are our alarms tuned correctly? Do we know early enough? Are our dashboards useful? If something's broken, does our dashboard help us find the cause, or does it get in the way? And from that, we're going to have a set of success criteria, a set of failure criteria, and some abort conditions. Again, we never want to cause real customer pain. And so if we are, we're going to abort the experiment, because that means we found something that, <laughs> that shouldn't be happening. At Amazon, this was orders per minute. If we saw an impact to the orders per minute, we would halt that experiment. We would clean it up. At Netflix, it was can people stream. And if that failed, if we saw a drop in that, we would automatically halt the experiment. And we would, even if it wasn't our fault, even if it happened that another outage was occurring at the same time, we don't want to muddy the water, and we don't want to, to cause confusion in this process. And then we run the experiment. And either the system behaves the way we expect, it gracefully degrades, the customer can't, the customer doesn't see the impact of that failure, or something breaks, something doesn't work the way we expect it. And if that's the case, we're done. We found a bug, we can go take it offline, we can understand why it occurs, we can make the customer experience better, and we can come back and test it at a later date. So an example of how to measure the failure. This is a graph uh, stolen from Netflix. The black line that runs across the top is whether people can stream. The green is, this is a hysterics command, the green is successful executions, and the red is a failed execution. And what you can see here is that we begin this experiment and we're injecting a small amount of failure, you know, 10 or 20% of the overall traffic. There's a little bit of uh, piling up here with retries and the like, but uh, suspend disbelief there. So, after we've run this experiment for 20 minutes, we see that customers are not impacted. They're still able to stream and things are working as expected. So now we ramp up that experiment. They go to about 50%, about 80%, and then to 100%. And at each step, we see failures occurring in the system. This service is not functioning. Uh, it's returning errors. But the customer experience is being maintained. It's still working correctly, and people are still able to stream. And at the end of this experiment, they can clean it up, they can roll it back, and what we've learned is if this service fails for a period of time, the customer won't notice. This takes something that might be a high severity, SEV1, SEV2 incident in the middle of the night, and turns it into something that we could look at the next day during business hours, where customers won't know, where obviously it provides some value, we want it to work, but when it's broken, it doesn't cause a lot of pain. The next tip is that we need, to, we need to practice this. You know, I like to draw on the fire drill analogy. You know, when there are emergency situations, when there are high stress, urgent things that occur, people need an opportunity to practice in advance. We want to build that muscle memory. We want to be able to handle that kind of situation in a clean and efficient manner. We don't want to panic. We want to be thoughtful. And so, as such, number one, we should be practicing. We should be running these in advance. I joke that the on-call training I've gotten at nearly every company is, here's your pager, good luck. There might be a run book, it's over there, no one's looked at it in a while. Figure it out, you're smart. And you know, imagine a world instead where the first time you're on call, your team comes to you and they say, hey, we know you're on call this week, you're gonna get a page, but don't worry. It's a mock exercise, we're in control. We have a safety net but we want you to treat it like a real event. We want, you to check. we want you to get engaged. We want you to look at your alarms. We want you to look at the dashboards. We want you to dig into the system to understand how it happens. But rather than during a, a stressful event in the middle of the night where you have you know, maybe leadership on the call, customers are, are worried at Netflix, Twitter's blowing up, people are unhappy, there, it's not a great time to ask questions. You know, it's hard. And, and you, you want to create an opportunity for people to learn and to ask questions about their service so that they can gain that familiarity and comfort before they're called upon to do it for real. 
Uh, James Hamilton, I'm, I'm a bit of a fan of his. Uh, he's a distinguished engineer, VP at AWS. Before that, he was at Microsoft Research. He wrote a paper, it's been 10 or 15 years, but to me it's almost like the ops bible. It has so much conventional, applicable wisdom in it. Uh, it's on designing and deploying internet scale services. And within this, he talks several times about this concept here, that if we're unwilling to test in production, it tells us something about how confident we are in our systems. If we're so worried that you know, losing a host or something getting slower is something that we're just unwilling to experiment with, then our system isn't in a good spot. We're, we're running too close to the edge or we don't have enough insight and understanding to be comfortable. And then he goes on to talk about if we have these recovery mechanisms, so perhaps we're able to evacuate regions in the case of a failure. Perhaps we have a database backup that is stored off-site. Have we ever recovered that database? Do we know that recovering that database is going to work correctly? Have we ever evacuated a region for real, or have we just talked about it? Uh, Adrian Cockcroft talks about this as availability theater. Things that we think are going to work, but in reality may not. And I've seen this exact, exact problem in action. If you are in the middle of one outage, and you go to solve that outage with this other recovery mechanism, and that recovery mechanism fails, you now have really a third outage. You have two outages going on at the same time. And instead of saving you and making your life better, it's actually made your life more complicated and more painful. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how we did this at Netflix so that we were prepared when the time came. So what, you know, great stories, but let's talk about some real world examples. Let's walk through some places where we've seen this in action. The first is this example of region evacuation. So in December of 2013, Netflix was down for about a day. A AWS had a failure in US East 1, and Netflix was only in US East 1. And so they decided that uh, it was important for them to go handle being cross-region and to be able to evacuate regions. This is exactly that kind of black swan event. A lot of people might say, well, AWS, they're smart. They're going to do, do a good job. They're going to... You know, these type of large-scale failures, they're just unlikely. And while that might be true, they may be unlikely, they're still running complex systems that are difficult to operate and to manage. And so the same types of things that we're susceptible to, they are. And so we need to prepare for this type of event. At Netflix, after they put this process in place, they started running these region evacuations every two to three weeks. In the beginning, this region evacuation took 45 minutes, it involved multiple teams, and it had a lot of manual interaction involved. Today, I think I read a blog post uh, a few months back, they have it down to being under five minutes, to being fundamentally entirely automated, and they're able to, to do it at a moment's notice. The key here is that they continue to run this process. They didn't say, oh, good enough, we're done now. Every two to three weeks, they evacuate a region for real. And why is this important? Because every other run or so, there's some new bug that surfaces. Maybe there's a new service that has a scaling boundary when it gets that flow, uh, that, that extra network traffic. Maybe there's a bug in our proxy code that doesn't allow us to redirect traffic in the way that we expect. Whatever the case may be, by regularly exercising this, they find and fix these issues when they arrive so that when things go wrong, it's there. It'll, it's reliable. It will work when it's called upon. And in my last six months at Netflix, uh, I actually had this come up twice. Uh, we had a Saturday or a Sunday morning where we couldn't get new hosts in uh, US East 1, and we knew that as traffic ramped up for the day that we were going to be under capacity. And this was a day when Reddit and Twitter were afire with, you know, kind of people bemoaning and, and a lot of pain. But because this was a regularly practiced event, I was secondary. My primary, she dis discovered what the problem was. She saw that it was a problem with AWS. We had a chat conversation, and we started shifting traffic before ever really having to need to engage the rest of the company. You know, we still did the conference bridge. We got everyone involved, but it was basically a non-event for us because it was well practiced, because it was well understood. And this is exactly the kind of position we want to be in. We want to be 
prepared so that when these events occur, they look like non-events. They look like they behave the way we want them to. Another example, who knows what's critical in their system and what's not, for certain? Yeah, we had this problem at Amazon too. Uh, one of the ways you became a tier one service at Amazon is you caused a customer facing outage. And if you weren't on the list, you were now on the list. And people on that list were held to a higher standard. They needed to do more preparation. They needed to be, they were paged into any large scale incident. There was a lot of extra work that went into being a tier one service. At Netflix, we came about a better way to discover this. We took some of our core workflows, you know, and take an Xbox, take a PlayStation, take an iPhone, and browse, you know, saw, lo, sign in, browse, find a movie, and play that movie. Does that, does that core workflow work? And then what we did is we automated that with some failure testing. We whitelisted what we thought were the critical services, and we failed traffic to all non-critical services. Now, whenever that automated experiment ran, if that failed, we knew that a new critical service had been introduced. And we could make a decision about whether we wanted that to be a critical service or not. And we'd go to those teams and we would say, hey, <laughs> do you know you're tier one now? And they would go, what? No. It's all right, we're just gonna, you know, we just want you to be paged into every major incident and do a lot of readiness and prep before you do a deploy. Or you could find some way to gracefully degrade and get out of the way. And nine times out of 10, they were like, oh no, I can just serve you a cash fallback and we can move on. And we thought that was great. You know, the less critical services, the less complexity, the easier it is to understand when things go wrong. And so I really, I really enjoyed that we found a better way to, to approach that problem. And then the, the question goes like, if we look forward five years, could we be in a position where just somebody else did all this testing for me and told me what would go wrong? And so I had the opportunity to work with Peter Alvaro. He's a Berkeley PhD, he's now at UC Santa Cruz. He had this idea called lineage-driven fault injection. And without going too deep into that, essentially, instead of looking at all the things that could go wrong, let's look at what went right and start removing things. It's kind of like Jenga blocks. If we remove something critical, it's gonna fall over. If we remove something that's not critical, we could do without it. So using the platform that I built at Netflix, we were able to take this over the summer and build a proof of concept, where in the background, on real production traffic, I think it was 0.0001% of production traffic, very small number of requests. We were able to run these kind of experiments. We were able to see how a, a service call worked or a graph worked. We were able to automatically remove things from it and then replay that request or find another request that was similar to that to see how it failed, to see if we were able to get by without those services. And what's interesting about this, I talked earlier, doing a brute force uh, analysis of a microservice graph, if you have 100 microservices, is two to the 100 executions. By having a better search space, by limiting it and being more thoughtful about how you explore it, we were able to do this in about 100 executions. I think it was 100 to 200. So much, much less complexity in how long it took us to search this space. And we found real production bugs at Netflix, some of which were single points of failure, single services or single teams, some of which were deep failures that required two or three things failing at the same time. And if you've ever run uh, production, production systems at scale, you know, I'd love it if things only failed one at a time, but most of the interesting outages are two or three things failing at the same time. And so what are we going for here? I mean, the outcome is there's a lot of toil in operations. There's a lot of burnout. There's a lot of pager fatigue. If we go through and we take a little bit more proactive approach and we explore this and we get comfortable with it, it won't feel as much like toil. We can be a little happier. And hopefully we're getting paged less. Hopefully we're not being woken up at two in the morning. This overall will help us increase the reliability of our services, which is of course key because things are gonna fail. And it's, in a bit, it's a bit foolhardy to hope that things aren't gonna fail. It's better to embrace that strategy and to dive into it. And so with that, one of the things that's exciting is this is, an, is a new space. 
It's up and coming, but we haven't figured it all out. There's a lot of room left for innovation and for growth. And so I want to invite everyone here to come join the chaos engineering community. Come and participate. We have a, a public Slack, it's not about Gremlin, that is just there for people to share their experiences and their, their learnings, their outages. I think we're just under 1,000 members. So if you, if you join today, you might get that, I think the 1,000th member we're going to do something fun or special about. And there's a whole bunch of meetups around the world that you can go and you can speak about your experiences, you can share your learnings, or you can learn from other people like you. And if there's not a meetup, then it's a great opportunity to go start one, to go take what you've learned or to take what is out there on the internet and you can learn and share it with the people around you. And with that, I'll give a, a short pitch for uh, our conference this uh, fall and September in San Francisco, which is going to be focused entirely on chaos engineering. Uh, we have Adrian Cockcroft from AWS, ex-Netflix, keynoting, as well as Jessie Frizzell, who's going to talk about failure in containers, uh, given her depth of experience there. So with that, I have one last t-shirt, because apparently people like our t-shirts. And so whomever wants to ask the first question, I will give the last remaining Gremlin t-shirt for. And with that, thank you very much for your time. First question for the, for the t-shirt. Come on. Now I, now I put too much stress on it. If you don't want the t-shirt, you don't have to take it. It's OK. Um, I was wondering, one of the, the critiques you had about the Chaos Monkey thing was that um, it was too random, if I can paraphrase it like that. Um, but I can imagine that there might be failures that you cannot think of beforehand, and they, they can happen. So um, don't you feel that there is some, um, some room for that, or there should be? Well, so first I would say that the, the failures that Chaos Monkey provides are rebooting hosts. So we're not going to necessarily learn something new that we couldn't do by just rebooting hosts ourselves. You know, in a way, it forces us to have a stateless application. That's part of why, you know, as Netflix was moving to the cloud, it was, hey, Amazon could do this at any time. You have to prepare for it. You have to be ready. So in that way, it's a good forcing function. It architecturally forced engineers at Netflix to think about what would happen when their hosts rebooted. But how do you measure the outcome of that experiment? If things are randomly breaking at random times, maybe it just contributes to this low-level background noise of failure. When I'm running experiments, I want to see a clear graph that tells me how things are behaving. I want something that's actionable as an outcome. I want to really understand where the tipping point is for my service. If I'm doing something like tuning thread pools or tuning timeouts, and there's a certain threshold where everything, you know, it's that elbow. Like if I, if I randomly inject random amounts of latency, how am I going to know where that elbow is? And how am I going to learn from that? So it's not to say that random failure t testing doesn't have a time and a place, but I find it to be easier to understand and much more easier to get actionable information by doing the non-random approach. Do you want the t-shirt? I'll take it. <laughs> Thank you for your question. Other questions? I have stickers, but no more t-shirts. I apologize. Uh, how, how do you get management to see worth of chaos engineering? That's a great question, because most people are a little defensive when you ask them to spend time or money on a new approach. And for me, that's why I talked about the cost of downtime. If you can translate it into lost revenue, lost engineering effort, and you can really quantify that pain that you're feeling, you're going to have a much better time convincing your management. If I can go and say, we lose every outage that lasts 30 minutes or more, we lose 150,000 euros. Right there, our management is going to say, well, that, I, could probably, I could probably pay an engineer to work on something for a year for that. And all of a sudden, now they can quantify it. If it becomes, hey, we would love to get these new features done, but we all got paged at 3 in the morning and then spent three days digging into this outage, and we still have some more work to do. Well, now you're, you're dealing with time lost. And that's time that isn't being spent on features. It isn't being spent on improving the system. It's feeling that reactive pain. So quantifying that, that cost is really what I think is, is the avenue for success there. Go ahead. Uh, 
I have a follow-up question on that. Uh, is there any data available on like how many, like how much of this uh, toil and thing is actually reduced? So I'll tell you my personal experience, which you can take as anecdote. But as it's a new space, I don't know of a lot of published studies or information. Um, I know that you know DynamoDB used this approach to test how they handled data center and network partitions and found and fixed issues before they went live. We saw a market increase of our, in our availability at Amazon and at Netflix as, as a direct result of this. In particular, my team at Netflix owned the, prox, the edge gateway, the proxy, and the API gateway. And when I arrived, we were getting paged often, and it was mid-tier services that would fail. Hystrix was actually born of this pain as well. But configuring Hystrix is hard, uh, which is part of what, what led to this. By going out and proactively failure testing the loss of those mid-tier services, we went from three nines of uptime to four nines of uptime, and my team got paid 25% less every year. So I'm a believer, but I know it's on me as a company owner to go find better metrics that support this. Ideally, I would like to find companies that aren't Amazon and Netflix. I would like to hear from the rest of the world, their experiences, their outcomes, how they've measured it, and the value that they get. Um, our priority one alarms only go off um, uh, when the customer is actually about to get hit. So how do you test those safely without hitting the customer? So again, that's the, the blast radius. You know, can, you, can you construct an experiment that might cause a small amount of customer pain, but not a large amount? So actually, the way that we did this at Netflix is we could just say what percentage of traffic we wanted to impact. And when we would first run an experiment, again, we would start and dev or test. We would make sure that kind of our, hap that our expectations at a high level were met. When we moved into production, the first experiment would be like 0.001% of traffic for as short a period as it took. And it was all eyes on the graphs, the metrics, the customer errors. And if we saw fail, if we could detect the failure, we didn't need to run more experiments. We could go and we could go understand where that came from and fix it. If we couldn't detect that failure, we were safe to move it up a notch. So 0.001%, cool, now we're going to go 1%. 1% is a good sanity check, now we can go to 10%. 10% behaves well, 50, 100. And one thing I forgot to mention is, really, you, you, you're testing for different things at different scale. When you're at that very small scale, it's do I handle exceptions? Do I handle nulls? Do I have a good fallback? Do I gracefully degrade? When you're at 50% or 100%, it's do I protect myself as a service? Do I shed traffic well? Am I a good citizen? Do I back off? When, when there's that much duress in the system at scale, are my thread pools or are my timeouts tuned appropriately so that I can continue to get work done without overwhelming someone else? Great. Thank you. Thank you. Any other online? I yeah. love the, I love that. <laughs> So in many cases, uh, the test proce procedure itself caused the biggest problem, like in nuclear reactors. So how you deal with that? The failing test procedure causing the... So, so not following best practice, by not following procedure, you can cause... Let's make sure I understand so, that correctly. So when you inject an error, you inject the chaos, and then that leads to, to massive failure? So, so again, I think this dovetails well with the question on blast radius, because if, if injecting a failure into like one container or one host brings down your whole system, you should probably know that, because that's pretty easy right. to do. Um, you know, again, you, you want to practice both your technical and your social ways of dealing with these failures. And so if you haven't had an opportunity to, to run through that, you don't want to be surprised that something could cause a catastrophic failure. And so in one way, you know, if, if, we're not, if we don't know that our system is in that state, then, then we're in trouble, because it's going to be a bad day when it happens. And I would rather know now, or I'd rather know when I have control and I have you know, my entire ops team looking at the problem, as opposed to, oh, surprise, everything's done. Any more questions? Uh, it is mainly targeted on finding failures, but uh, in your experience, did you come across data corruptions, inconsistencies, 
uh, introduced as a result of? That's a good question. It can get sticky, right? You corrupt some data as part of an experiment or in the real world, and you, you can be difficult to debug it and to do it. We were really thoughtful about the potential data impact of the experiments we ran. We tend to do them at service boundaries on things that are item potent or things that could handle real world failure. I mean, the, the flip side is uh, if, a, if a naturally occurring failure can cause data corruption in your service, that's still a problem you have to deal with. And if you're not aware of it and you don't know how to mitigate it, you, you may need to. But if you run an experiment that corrupts a bunch of data and causes a bunch of pain, it's, that's, it's that's similar to that blast radius where you, you don't want to break everything and you want to understand the impact of it. But, but I'll just say, that's, that's, uh, that's chaos engineering uh, 201 uh, or 301. It's a little bit more advanced. You want to do the manual exploration, then you want to automate it, then go after the data. <laughs> Is there some threshold in terms of system size or company size when it makes sense to do chaos engineering? I think that um, you think about the cost of downtime helps you quantify how important it is to you. If you do the cost of downtime calculation, if an outage, you know, if you're a small startup and then you go down and no one notices, then maybe it's, maybe it's not that important for you to spend time. I'm actually in that world, and if we go down, it's not. We, we design for it, but uh, our customers would not be happy. There's a big impact to brand or trust. And so it's really a question of, I don't know, of value. I'm a big value person. If you can spend two hours and save yourself 10 hours, then spend two hours. If you can spend two hours to save two hours, maybe it's not worth it. Any more questions? And the last one is, uh, are you using chaos engineering within your own company? Oh, absolutely. We dog food. Or as, as Uncle Jeff from Amazon said, we drink our own champagne. We do failure Fridays. We regularly break our service. We've actually blogged about a couple of things. We had some embarrassing ones early on. We had uh, a disk fill up that caused a host. It wasn't log rotating. It wasn't cleaning up. That caused some downtime. Um, we use DynamoDB. Guess what happens when you introduce latency into like your key data store? Uh, things can go sideways quick. Um, so I, I, I practice what I preach in that regard. <laughs> well, thank you all very much for your time and for your questions. If you have any other questions, you're welcome to come talk to me offline. My team's out there for a booth. Grab a sticker. Um, hopefully, we'll see you in the community or at events. But if nothing else, I appreciate your time and attention.